Okay, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everybody, depending on your time zone. Uh, welcome to our meeting of student mobility during Corona era, actions and effects in different countries. Uh, my name is Harri, Harri Suominen, or Harry if it's easier. I'm located here in Finland and uh, all of our participants are coming from actually all the continents in the world except Antarctica, I believe. So we had 250 registrations from around 20 different countries. Warmly welcome to this uh, event. I will be your host today. Uh, we are having very interesting speakers and panelists in the discussion. And you are just going to change the slide so here you can see the agenda. So opening is now going on and then uh, around eight minutes we will have a keynote from Peter Festerbakka about like what kind of opportunities there is during this crisis. Then 9.30, uh, we are going to hear from Korea, from Dr. Yuna Ri from Hankook University of Foreign Studies, that what kind of measures they have been taking at their campus and also generally in Korea, so that uh, the situation is as good as it, it is at the moment in Korea, which used to be the epicenter of Corona still a couple of months ago. Then we will uh, continue maybe to the most interesting part of the uh, event today, which is the panel discussion, 9.45. And we are going to have uh, very great panelists there. I will introduce them shortly. But we are going to have representatives from France, from Germany, from Finland, from America, and uh, from Finland. Yeah, I mentioned that already. So let's get started. Uh, before we go to these uh, keynotes, we, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background of uh, Asia Exchange, what we are doing, how we are also dealing at Asia Exchange during the crisis. All right, so how we are doing, dealing this in Finland. This is an iconic picture which has been circulating in internet. So you can see how it was before the outbreak and also after the outbreak. So in Finland, we really much value our social distancing in any case, so this is nothing new for us. Uh, in Finland, we had at the moment 5,500 registered cases, 250 deaths. Uh, so it is not that bad situation than in many other countries, but still, there's a long way to go that we can be relieved. Next slide, please. So Asia Exchange. Um, very shortly, the birth story. Uh, I was an exchange student in 2005 in Shanghai. And then we got with my good friend Tuomas, who now lives in Hong Kong. Um, and I, Harry, we, we can't see the slides. Okay. Right now. Let's try. We can try again. Wait. All right. Stop sharing now. All right. My colleague tries to fix that. But anyway, let's not that stop to us so I can continue. So uh, we started Asia Exchange because of the own experiences when we were starting in Shanghai. It was first two guys who were doing this. Nowadays, we are a company of 20 people. We have been helping more than 7,000 students to go to study in selected universities in Asia. They have been from 550 different universities. And um, yes, uh, from uh, 84 different countries. And our partner universities, we only have a handful of those because we think that it's important that you really know your partner. They are located in China, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, Thailand, and the newest one in Vietnam. If you can see the slide, uh, there is also a print screen of a Pi News when uh, uh, we were celebrating a couple of years ago, our 10 year anniversary and whole team traveled to Bali, Indonesia to meet our students, meet our partner universities and celebrate a special year. But yes, uh, we strongly believe in the collaboration and uh, working together and being a fulfilling option for these more traditional student exchanges that uh, are usually like bilateral MOUs and different networks between the universities. And very happy to work with most of you who are there online. I, I believe we have helped some of your students to go abroad. The next slide is about our actions during the corona outbreak. Not sure are you able to see my slide at the moment. Okay, well then I just speak. 
it's not a slide set anyway, a uh, slide show only, it's, uh, it's about people. So if you, you want us can take away the chat yes. window so yes. I can see this. So we have uh, now introduced at HXA uh, as flexible as, and student-friendly policies as possible. So students have been able to postpone their semester or if they are not able to travel to Asia this year, they are able to postpone it. There's also other destinations available if your semester abroad is cancelled, so you can change it very easily. And of course, there's free farms if, uh, if you are not able to go. And of course, uh, delivering information like daily basis is very, very important. And it seems, based on the di discussions we have had with multiple universities, that many of us are still lacking of like the actual information and what kind of measures different countries, different universities are taking at the moment. Uh, we try to do our best that we are delivering the unbiased information from Asia, what is the situation there, and that was also actually the idea to have this webinar came after talking with multiple universities in Europe and in Asia. And of course, uh, updating the students and updating the parents, something that most of you are also doing almost like daily basis, that's, that's important. Uh, one important thing, uh, if we still think that it might be possible for students to go this year to Asia, uh, are the extended deadlines. So most of our partner universities in Asia have agreed that they can still accept students the whole summer, even until end of July uh, in some of the destinations. So this is just for you to know that if there is students who still, if the borders are open and if we still, after a couple of weeks, believe that it is safe to go, then there's still options available. The situations in different countries in Asia, so um, I'm not an expert to tell like how it is in every single country from like a medical perspective and so on. But the observations that we have been making, uh, I was by myself like a month ago still in Korea, and uh, I left to Asia before the pandemic really escalated uh, in, in Europe. So I needed to change my travel plans multiple times as well, but still I'm happy that I was able to go there, meet our students, meet the universities and experience it literally with my own nose how Korea uh, is taking care of the situation. They tested me when I arrived to the airport and uh, I got guaranteed and really now can tell why, why the situation is that good there. Also in China, life is returning to normal. I was just talking with a friend yesterday and, and businesses are open and also our partner university, Shanghai University, is taking students in for the autumn intake. Taiwan is one of the role model countries, only 439 reported cases, six deaths, very good situation there at the moment. Vietnam has also this week opened their campuses, their schools, so things are looking good. They were also extra cautious a uh, month ago, two months ago, so that uh, the pandemic wouldn't outbreak like a very, very big time. Uh, in Bali, Indonesia, which is one of our destinations, uh, spring semesters are at the moment conducted online. Uh, for autumn semester, sem uh, they are still accepting applications. At the moment, it seems that the semesters will run there. Malaysia business have started to reopen uh, just a couple of days ago. They have been locked down since March 18, but now Malaysia is opening up and we hope that uh, the pandemic doesn't grow too much. And UPM, which is our partner university there, is a good example now. 27,000 students there, very high ranked, US ranking 159 university, they decided to postpone their whole semester with one month, so for everybody. So they are starting in October instead of September, so that as many students could go as possible. Thailand is now our only destination where uh, three out of four of our partner universities have already informed that they are not running the international student exchange semester uh, next August intake. And I have heard from many universities in Europe that uh, their partners have informed the same. All right, uh, I have now passed my slot or my time. It would be time for a keynote from Peter Westerbach. Are we still able to see the slides? Yeah. 
Excellent. So just very short introduction for Peter, because if I would tell everything he has been doing, this would be a whole webinar only about that. But uh, Peter, it came the most well known maybe uh, after Angry Birds, like the whole basically company and uh, the came is because of his actions that he took a couple of or maybe a, more than a decade ago already. He is also a founder of Slush, which is the biggest startup event and totally run by students. He has also been, uh, he is the action professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at Zhongxi University and also a very good friend here and we are also doing things together with Peter. But maybe Peter, you can elaborate a little bit more and how do you see this crisis and what kind of silver lining there might be in the situation? Yeah. Very good. So, uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, you never know. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Peter and uh, I would say that I've uh, been an entrepreneur uh, pretty much all my life. And uh, for me, entrepreneurship is all about uh, doing things. So, I've ended up uh, doing many things. And, uh, and yeah, Slush, uh, Angry Birds uh, were already uh, mentioned. And I, I think that, uh, of course, now uh, we we are in a, in a uh, crisis and, and something that we haven't uh, seen before. But uh, I think that uh, part of being an entrepreneur is that you always uh, you see opportunities, not uh, kind of like only problems. And uh, I've been saying uh, since the beginning of, of the crisis that uh, we should also keep in mind that every crisis uh, is also uh, an opportunity. And, and especially if you look at kind of like from uh, uh, entrepreneurship and, and kind of like uh, uh, organization and company building uh, perspective. Uh, uh, most of the most successful uh, uh, companies and, and things in general actually uh, have emerged always uh, uh, from crisis because then uh, you're kind of like pushed out of your uh, comfort zone and uh, you actually have to do something. So I think that that is something that uh, we should all uh, uh, keep in mind. And then uh, uh, always when talking about uh, uh, the future then and, and we don't know uh, you know when this crisis will uh, pass and, and uh, what will will happen so uh, again uh, that uh, you know is true for all of us that uh, it's it's uh, pretty tough to predict the future but then uh, one very good thing about uh, the future of course is that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, impact the future with our actions so so it's it's not that uh, there's some kind of predefined like destiny or or anything like that and i think that this is something that we should always uh, keep in mind that we should now uh, you know talking about student mobility and talking about like the situation in different places i think that's also uh, we can see that uh, you know different actions have led to different uh, outcomes and we have different uh, Kind of like uh, virus situation in in uh, in uh, all the different you know uh, countries mentioned by Harry uh, before. So uh, so again, uh, the example of the fact that uh, our actions matter. Uh, and of course, it's it's a very very difficult situation. But uh, then uh, you know, slush was uh, mentioned, and that is actually one example of something that we created during the last uh, economic crisis in two thousand and eight, and. Uh, yeah, I always uh, like using that as an example of uh, uh, the fact that uh, there are very few things that are impossible. Uh, maybe a bit of my background uh, that's also related to to, uh, to slush and entrepreneurship and startup piece. Uh, I actually started my working career at uh, what I would call the original startup, uh, so the one that uh, Bill and Dave uh, started in their garage in 1939 in Palo Alto in California. And that's actually uh, the company that we have to thank for, uh, you know, having to uh, suffer all of these uh, garage stories, you know, in the years uh, past that. Uh, but that was actually uh, uh, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, and they started uh, this fantastic company, HP, uh, all the way back in 1939, so before my time, obviously. But uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to meet with uh, uh, Bill and Dave when they were still alive. And uh, they were really uh, fantastic entrepreneurs. And uh, not only did they start, uh, you know, fantastic company, HP, but they actually started the whole Silicon Valley. That's where kind of like, uh, 
uh, the Silicon Valley got started and uh, that uh, garage, which is you know pretty modest garage, is still there in Palo Alto. So if you are your way there, uh, you know, go check it out. But uh, anyway, uh, Silicon Valley got started there all the way back in 1939. And, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't started by, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, you know, one of these newcomers. I think that's something that is uh, uh, always good to keep in mind. And also that uh, it's a long time ago, so these things take uh, a while uh, to build. But then uh, with, with Slush, actually, uh, uh, what, what I wanted to mention there is, is that, uh, okay, everybody, of course, uh, 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 if you pretty much anywhere you go and anywhere I go, uh, you know, be it in Asia or be it, uh, you know, anywhere, uh, most people are then telling me that, oh, we want to be the Silicon Valley of, uh, you know, China or we want to be the Silicon Valley of Asia or the Silicon Valley of, you know, something. So everybody wants to be uh, Silicon Valley. So clearly... Uh, Silicon Valley is a role model uh, for uh, for many, uh, but then um, when everybody wants to be Silicon Valley, uh, then what we decided to do here in, in Finland uh, was actually not to be the Silicon Valley. So uh, uh, we actually uh, started this uh, uh, startup event all the way back in 2008. The first one we had uh, 300 people show up, and uh, we had just asked like. Uh, fellow entrepreneurs, founders to share their perspective uh, on uh, entrepreneurship and uh, building companies and, and all of that uh, with the young people. And uh, it was, uh, you know, very successful, very small event. And then at that event, I told everybody that, hey, actually, we're going to make this the biggest and best startup event on the planet. And then I immediately got pushed back, but hey, wait a minute, Peter, what about like Silicon Valley? And I said, okay, what about it? I mean, I know my way around there, been, uh, you know, uh, working there and, and uh, you know, the HP story that I just shared and like the garage stories, all of that stuff. And uh, of course, very few people believe that, uh, uh, you know, we could do that. But then if you look at, uh, at Slush uh, last year, we had 25,000 people uh, from more than 160 countries come to Helsinki in November. And uh, then, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, why is Slush called Slush? Uh, slush is called Slush because we organize it in November. So uh, when you come to Helsinki, then it's cold, it's dark, probably there is slush on the ground. So it's very clear that it's not the Silicon Valley. It's better. And it's better because it's different. And uh, the point here is that, okay, uh, when everybody is doing something, then uh, many times if you are doing things differently, you win. Uh, because different in this case, uh, many times means better. And, and that's also what uh, we did with Slush. And why is it different? Actually, uh, the biggest startup event on the planet, uh, okay, it's organized in the cold and dark and in the slush and all of that, but it's organized and run by 2,600 young people from more than 60 countries. So we put the young people in charge. They made it happen. And I think that this is something that is very, very important, that uh, you should always look at, uh, you know, uh, the opportunities and also then think about, you know, like, how can you do things a bit differently? And now when we talk about, uh, you know, the crisis and uh, all of that, many people are getting uh, paralyzed. And then, you know, it's, it's uh, nice to have an excuse in the form of a crisis, a virus or something like that. Oh, we can't do this, we can't do that because, you know, there is the crisis. And uh, if you look at, again at, at Slush, I mean, I remember very well when we had, uh, you know, our, our uh, prime minister and several of the other ministers visiting Slush, and this was like in 2009 and 10, when we had uh, this very deep economic crisis going on, and then they came to the event, and then they were like, hey, what is going on here? We have all of these... Uh, entrepreneurs and all of these, uh, you know, people that are uh, driven and full of energy and passion and they're, you know, like running around making stuff happen. And then you go outside and it's cold and dark and there is like a recession going on and it's doom and gloom. So like what is going on here? This is like a parallel universe. And, and the point here uh, is that, uh, you know, getting back to, to the fact that, you know, the future is not some, something that is uh, like predefined or anything like that. And, and I think that, uh, you know, it was uh, Alan Kay who said that, you know, the best way to predict the future is, you know, to 
make it. And, and I think that this is very much true now when we talk about the current situation, we talk about student mobility or we talk about anything, that uh, it's really up to us uh, to make stuff happen. And now when we look at, uh, you know, the current environment, yes, uh, every government, uh, you know, has been uh, doing various versions of quarantines and lockdowns and various success and all of that. Uh, and I think that uh, that is, you know, the way it is. But then at the same time, we should also look at what is already happening now in Asia, where there are a few steps ahead of, you know, us here in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, things are opening up, things are getting back to normal. And many people are now saying uh, that it's the new normal. I mean, there is, okay, new and old and whatever normal, but I think that it's always, you know, reality is like normal. So we have to live in the world uh, we live in, but we can always uh, have an impact. We can always shape it. And I think that it's very important, again, that we think about, you know, the young people, the experience that they will have the impact, uh, you know, that this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, semester away, you know, in Asia or uh, where it might be, uh, that has a fantastic, uh, you know, impact uh, on their life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, an amazing opportunity. So I think that it's uh, very important to then look at kind of like the opportunities and, and uh, what we can do in, in this uh, uh, current uh, situation. And it keeps changing uh, kind of like on a daily basis. Also, that said, uh, I think that uh, there are many opportunities now that we are forced to do things uh, online remotely. Uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity there to do things even faster than before. Uh, so one initiative that we kicked off during the crisis is something called Ambitious Africa. You can find out more if you go to ambitious.africa. Uh, so that's like the website. Uh, but anyway, uh, connecting uh, Nordics, connecting Europe with all of Africa and looking at like what we can do there. Originally, we thought that we'll go to all 54 nations like physically, but actually now because the crisis is not possible. So we are now instead of spending a year doing uh, this, you know, visiting and going there, we can do all of this in a month because we're forced to do it online. And we've been joined by, uh, uh, you know, fellow entrepreneurs, students, ministers, uh, and that probably wouldn't have happened without the crisis. Uh, but now it's perfectly okay to join, like we're online today. So uh, I think that there's lots of opportunity and it's up to us to actually grab those opportunities, you know, crisis or not. And, uh, you know, if we can make, uh, you know, the biggest and best startup event happen by working together up here in, in, uh, in Helsinki, up here in the north, uh, then, you know, uh, no reason why we couldn't do anything else uh, by working together. So, uh, yeah, very happy to, to be here. And I think that this is a great example of uh, also how to tackle these challenges. Uh, it's all about working together, comparing notes, sharing best practices, getting stuff done. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, sharing more and uh, learning more. So, so that's, uh, that's why I'm here. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for, for listening uh, so far. And, uh, yeah, we can uh, get, uh, get on with the program. So uh, thank you on, uh, on my behalf. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, very good insights from you. And uh, are you able to stay around for the rest of the yeah, webinar? I will be here. I will be here. All right, if you have anything to comment, feel free. And uh, I know you have two kids as well, so uh, and uh, in a few years they are going to go also to university, I believe. So sure. what do you think? Should you recommend them to take the advantage to go abroad to study a semester there? Do you want them to do their degree in Finland completely? How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, they're already pitching to them that they should go uh, and uh, spend as much time outside of the country as possible. So I think that that's like very important. And I tend to do that myself as well, you know, like when, when we're not, uh, you know, restricted by crisis. So I think that it's very important and it's, it's uh, uh, that's the way to, to learn. And also, uh, I think also to appreciate, uh, you know, like what, what you have. So I think that it's super important to, uh, uh, broaden your perspective and that's why I think that it's uh, very important that we do uh, uh, whatever we can uh, to increase the student mobility and I, I think that there are many forces uh, not just the crisis working against uh, mobility and, and there's a lot of uh, uh, of that kind of uh, sentiment in, in many 
places. So I think that uh, it's it's very important that we we increase the mobility and uh, we create more more connections between uh, you know the the people and and uh, there was also like this ambitious that Africa uh, initiative that I mentioned. That's also all about creating this super connectivity between between the people on uh, you know different cities, different continents. So I think that it's uh, very important that we keep keep pushing that. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm a believer. Yeah, totally agree. And I think this audience probably also agree. We all want people to go abroad. We all have experienced that. Uh, the next in the program, uh, we are going to have uh, Dr. Yuna Ri from Hankook University of Foreign Studies in Seoul, Korea. <laughs> so, Yuna, I hope uh, we can see your slides. Let's try. If it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay. But let's try. Welcome. Stage is yours. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, let me try to share my PowerPoint. Hang on. Uh -huh. While you are trying to load it, I can introduce that Yuna uh, pretty recently started as the Dean of the International, International Affairs of Hankook University of Foreign Studies in Korea. You have a long career there in the public relations office, I believe, and, uh, and uh, you know about student mobility and marketing and everything, but you can tell a little bit more yourself. Okay, um, I'm not able to share my PowerPoint application, but I use the option of screen share. Uh, can you guys see the uh, PowerPoint application? Yeah, it works. Okay. Okay, so let me just start. I have about uh, 10 minutes, so I should be very quick um, I can in terms you of... I can give I'm you sorry? 15. I can give you 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, you can also see the minutes? <laughs> no, I, I mean that I can give you 15 minutes, so yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'll use the full 15 minutes then. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, my name is Yuna Ri, and it's an honor for me to uh, share the case study of our how our university managed the uh, COVID-19 crisis as a university. Um, this uh, sort of is a, well, we were evaluated as one of the model cases in Korea um, as well, because as of now, we are uh, defined as a, a clean zone within our uh, sector in Seoul. So I'm proud to uh, present to you that we don't really have any uh, confirmed cases as of today. Uh, so with that, let me start um, how all this uh, pandemic crisis started for us. Uh, first of all, uh, I have uh, dissected this uh, span of time within three blocks or four blocks uh, rather. Uh, the early stage of the COVID-19 crisis um, started for us uh, in early February. Well, actually, uh, late January. However, early February was the, the active time that we have gathered as a committee to deal with uh, this crisis as a, as a, the, uh, univer as a university system. Um, as you can see from the red uh, wording, uh, at this stage, we were crazy in terms of uh, trying to figure out who's where and um, who has symptoms and who doesn't have a symptom and whether our students are in uh, Korea or outside Korea and if outside Korea where they are. And because we have about more than 3,000 um, international students under our management, it was extremely hard for us to actually uh, collect data in the first set. Um, however, our goal was to conduct a uh, exhaustive survey on Chinese students and uh, those who have visited China. Um, and this included not only students, but also faculty and admin uh, administrative staff uh, who visited uh, China then. Because we were dealing with more than 3,000 or 4,000 people, including the staff and the faculty members, we had to have a system where we can kind of recognize uh, which is the priority group that we have to focus on. 
So we have decided to categorize our uh, students into three uh, typologies. A was those uh, who actually were from Hubei and who have visited Hubei were categorized as A. Um, and type B referred to Chinese students who were scheduled to live in dormitories uh, upon their arrival in Korea. And uh, C type was defined as students who don't live on campus. However, um, they were all those uh, who lived off campus and probably they, they are more of the majority than those who lived in dorms for our university's case. So it was really kind of hard for us to uh, systematically find them uh, because they don't register for dorms, they have their freedom to report to whatever they want in terms of their living addresses and whatnot. So C type was really hard for us to uh, kind of fine tune uh, the exact data um, and systematically contact them according to those information that they have given us. Um, and with this uh, crazy survey uh, plan, um, I think our staff members couldn't go home <laughs> for about uh, for about good 30 to 40 days um, every day we had to uh, use our manpower to call them via SNS uh, telephone email whatever method we can uh, to find out where they were um, and when they were planning to come back uh, to Korea um, and this uh, frenzy was ongoing as we were also uh, gearing up for the plan for picking them up upon their return to Korea because we didn't want them to uh, make contact with our um, society community members because they were very much afraid then uh, to come in contact with anybody who came from a foreign country, especially from China. So we really had to separate this group and protect them um, and have them picked up from the airport, airport from the get-go and directly uh, kind of move them to our separate quarantine quarter, uh, which was located in our satellite campus, global campus, that's how we call them. And we uh, targeted B-type students uh, to come into these separate quarters. Um, and we provided uh, direct pickup service from the airport and we also set up the Center for Monitoring and Emergency Response for COVID-19 for type C students uh, to have them monitor their health upon their arrival in Korea and also provide guidance for self-quarantine and also uh, call them daily to check up on them whether they are feeling okay. And if they had symptoms, we wanted them to come to us and also um, have a medical service of, uh, on hand to treat them right. Um, also, we were, uh, all, all of this was going on and we were desperately trying to purchase uh, masks and disinfective uh, gels and all of those goods that were out of the stock um, and we were uh, kind of really doing whatever we can to uh, figure out a way to uh, get these materials on our hands so that we can distri distribute this to our international stakeholders and whatnot. Um, so as uh, we did this survey here, as you can see, uh, for about two months, we were using full manpower to uh, reach out to our 2,000 and more international students in the first round. And 90%, we covered 90% of our students and we figured out where they were, how they were feeling, and when they were coming back to Korea. And with that data, uh, we started all the targeted communication programs for COVID-19 crisis. The second round, we started to include not only the mainland China uh, students, but also included uh, students from Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, because our government uh, recognizes mainland China as uh, China, Hong Kong and Macau students were not included in the outset. However, uh, it was decided that it's necessary that we expand this um, uh, realm. So we included a thousand more students um, within our data survey. 
And as I have explained to you, the monitoring center also uh, did the following um, measures. Also, we uh, figured out or we uh, planned up a standard operation manual and we distributed this to our administrative staff so that they can uh, know what to do upon their identification of a confirmed case of international students or international staff members and whatnot. And we also had to report back with our Ministry of Education um, uh, on our progress. And this was done on a daily basis. And we also had to cross check with our immigration office about whether our students are actually here or whether they are uh, still outside uh, our national boundaries and whatnot. So these, all of these were um, happening all together in the early uh, stages of our crisis management. And as you can see, the booth, uh, airport booth was looking like this. And we actually had uh, people stand here to uh, greet our students from China and other uh, areas of uh, the foreign nations and had them register with us. And then we carried them over to our school bus and then directly uh, moved them to the quarantined um, establishments um, that I have explained to you in the previous slides. And also here, as you can see, uh, the monitoring center um, also was set up like this, where everybody's wearing masks and everybody's using their computers to um, do chatting with the SNS uh, social media service. And we also had phones. Um, so about 20 to 30 people um, at one time uh, were doing this the whole day, entire day, to call 3,000 students to actually monitor um, their whereabouts and their health um, status and whatnot. And this is the uh, quarters, the dorm, um, a shot of the dormitory that was used for quarantine. And this is how they have um, disinfected all the uh, establishments that were used for the quarantine as well. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So uh, these are some of the major um, uh, policies that were taken uh, in the early stages. And as we entered mid-March or late March, um, our national alert level for COVID-19 uh, was raised up to four, where social distancing was very much strengthened or enforced rather. Um, and here uh, we had to also reach out to our Korean outbound exchange students as well. And also our Korean students who were uh, coming from Daegu and Gyeongbuk, a local province where uh, exponential amounts of uh, confirmed cases um, were found. So we were expanding our survey, not only to include the international students, but also the Korean students at this uh, stage. And at this point, uh, control for the physical campus entrance uh, was established as well. And we have decided to uh, postpone our uh, start of the semester. And also we uh, have decided that we cannot offer offline classes and we started online classes only policy for the first four weeks, but this turned out to be eight weeks. Um, and we started to provide video lectures, which was not in plan. And we provided three different types of um, options for our lecturers and professors, uh, which also was a very chaotic phase because we were really not ready for this. And here we also started a physical closure of multi-use facilities, including cafeterias, libraries, and gyms, and campus. Uh, no off-campus visitor, visitors were allowed um, in our buildings without um, measuring their temperature, body temperature, and they had to wear a mask um, in order to enter any of the buildings and they had to register for um, entrance, their entrance for each buildings. And we had to shorten our work hours and we had uh, some parts of the team working from home. Uh, we had to use uh, video conferencing to actually work with someone who had uh, 
uh, conspicuous uh, symptoms of COVID-19. So these were some of the measures um, taken um, in the second phase. And the third block that I wanted to emphasize is this. Uh, throughout phase one and two, we really had a high emphasis on ongoing communication on COVID-19. Um, we, early on, we set up the emergency control committee that can oversee all of these uh, communications and policy decisions uh, were made. And we had a separate micro homepage for COVID-19 that can provide uh, relevant information for all the stakeholders of our campus. And important announcements were instantly uploaded so people can check on uh, the changing policies that will affect them immensely, uh, such as academic calendars, online lectures, the shortening of work hours, um, and whatnot. And here, as you can see, uh, this is how our emergency control committee looked like, where our president was the chairman and uh, our VPs of the satellite campus and South campus were the uh, vice chairman. And deans, all of the deans, as, as you can see, I'm not going to read all of these, but then the deans of overall campus uh, facilities or administrative offices were involved in the it's this committee where we had not daily, but I think we had meetings every uh, every other day, I think, um, in the early phases. Um, now we don't have that many uh, meetings of the ECC. However, uh, we constantly shared information as a committee, and also we have this uh, social media uh, chat rooms where information was going on uh, 24 hours a day. Um, so it was always on, uh, that's what I'm going, I'm, I'm trying to say, I guess. And as you can see from here, international admissions team and international affairs team, these, these two are my key teams. And we, I think we had to uh, work really hard throughout all these phases. Um, and as you can see, all these members are key in terms of controlling uh, something like COVID-19 on a campus, I believe. And let me see. Yes, this is the micro homepage uh, that I have explained to you where uh, we had all the necessary information about the changing academic calendars, uh, what was done and how many people were confirmed and whatnot and where to contact um, and uh, the postings of various departments were uh, congregated here and we could just click this site and find out anything that I wanted on COVID-19 and what Huffs was doing about it. So this was really helpful. And what we had done as a global university, we took special care for students um, uh, who were actually from Wuhan because they were uh, very much, um, very much stricken by this uh, pandemic in the early stages, and they were uh, very much hurt uh, from some of the uh, prejudice uh, that this disease uh, mongered in the early stages. So what we had done was not only to write uh, letters to the parents and students, but also we had placards in our physical campus where this reads as um, you are all of our uh, campus community and we want you back and we want you to be safe. All of these uh, measurements were done um, in consideration of the psychological uh, stability uh, that we wanted our students to have, international students to have. And with this, we were also publicized. We didn't um, uh, pull out pre press releases, but we were picked up uh, by the uh, media, Korean media, um, and the minister, minister of Education also visited us because of this um, event, and she encouraged our uh, international flexibility, or rather the psychological support that we are trying to uh, give to our international stu students, and she appreciated, uh, officially appreciated our efforts here. So, which was pretty good for us in a sense. Dr. Um, Lee. Yep. Yes. Very interesting. Uh, I need to 
say that uh, if you still have like the final lines uh, of your presentation, I would need to uh, start the panel discussion very soon. But I really like what I'm hearing, and I'm sure that the students have appreciated this very warm-hearted actions. And uh, this is like bringing this is like a silver lining, I believe, in the crisis that we are in introducing uh, this kind of new measures and collaboration and showing caring for uh, different stakeholders. Yes. Well, I think I'm done. Um, actually, this is the last slide. If you allow me, if you'll allow me to go through this uh, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> so finally, all of those measures were taken and the result um, is as follows. However, there were downsides, of course, to this, where after the COVID-19, the registra registration rate really uh, decreased for us greatly. And the budget issue was also pretty big. Um, so we had to take toll in terms of um, having to use the budget that was not actually categorized or planned for COVID-19. Uh, so we did get some government subsidy on this. However, um, if you are going through a similar um, case, then you might want to early on talk with your government um, uh, officials in terms of how the costs are going to be, has to be supported. Um, and this is the last slide where now in a, we are in a stage where uh, COVID-19 is stabili stabilizing. And with this, we are starting off our face-to-face um, -face classes. And because the students are not able to actually travel at this point, uh, we are going to offer online classes as well as offline, uh, online and offline cases simultaneously. And we are resuming um, our offline lectures on May 11th. And we have a strict system where we are allowing um, online, I mean, offline uh, classes. And we are very much flexible in terms of opening our opening up our uh, business uh, physically offline. Um, and until this point, we still don't really have any confirmed cases or unstable un instability um, that's coming from COVID-19. So this is sort of um, a snapshot of where we are and what we have done uh, through COVID-19 pandemic in Korea. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. Thank you so much. Uh, really good actions, really good examples. I, I wish that uh, not only we are following like the Korean measures as a as a nation, but also we can kind of uh, copy the best practices that uh, the universities are implementing in different countries. So thank you so much for sharing this. Very happy to work together with you. I need to say uh, we have uh, 54 HXA students studying at Hoofs at this very moment. And only three of them returned back home during this semester, if I'm not mistaken. I was happy to meet most of them uh, for uh, like a uh, nice student welcoming dinner when I was a month ago in, in Korea. And everybody was feeling very safe. So thank you for accommodating that. Now we need to move on uh, and we can move to the panel discussion, which I'm very excited about. And thanks, thanks everybody for paying attention. And you can see on the left hand side, there's the question and answer uh, section. So you can throw your questions there. I have my friends here who are helping me to pick up the most interesting ones. We try to answer, answer some of those or ask some of those from the panelists. Can you now see the panelist slide? The handsome and beautiful faces. Yes, very good. Excellent. So uh, I will be moderating this and uh, I can shortly introduce who we have here. And let's have a very interactive, good discussion. We have around 40 minutes. And uh, if it's uh, not enough and people still want to continue, we can steal some extra time. But uh, yes, we have uh, Yuna, Dr. Ri, you already have uh, get to know. And then we have Akos Kirali, who is uh, located in Germany and working as a director of marketing and recruitment at Lancaster University in Leipzig. Hello, everyone. And, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Welcome, Akos. Perfect. Perfect. Thank and you. Thanks for reacting with a short notice for, for our invitation. Thank you so much. Then uh, 
There's the ball. I cannot see who is behind there, but I guess it's actually Michael from France. And you have always had this very beautiful looking last name, but I still don't remember <laughs> how to pronounce it. It's a, it's it's a difficult one, I know. Yes. Thank you. I just, Hi, everyone. Yeah, welcome, Michael. And uh, how much you, by the way, have time for the panel? That's fine. That's fine. I can stay a little longer. Don't worry. Very good. Yeah, I remember there was some time schedule challenges, but great if you can be. So Michael is the Vice President of International Relations at University Le Havre Normandie in France. Then we have Maddie. Maddie is uh, our student, American student studying in Korea. So now we can hear that our students also feeling the same like, like Dr. Rhee was just mentioning. Welcome Maddie, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Very good. Good to have you here. Then we have Janne Hokkanen, uh, our Finnish representative, who is the Director of Study at International Affairs at Lappeenranta University of Technology. Welcome, Janne. Can you hear us, Janne? Seems that we are not having Janne online at the moment. We will try to get him. But I can mention that Lappeenranta University of Technology is one of these challenging top universities in the world and they have a nice ambition to save the world with uh, all these green ecological values while at the same time making sustainable business. Then uh, we have also, if Janne is not able to join, then luckily we have Tuomas Kauppinen or Thomas straight from Hong Kong. Welcome Thomas. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to meeting you all. Greetings from Hong Kong. Yes, uh, this guy is the, my pal since high school already. We both have uh, born and lived in a city called Nokia in Finland, which is a city of 30,000 people. And, and together we went to study in Shanghai with Tuomas and came up with this company afterwards. All right, let's start. So uh, let's start from the most important. So. Mary, I have a question for you. That how do you feel as a student at the moment there in Korea? You have been there for a while. Tell us how are, how how are things? Um, I mean, I am still enjoying it very much this semester. It's despite all the challenges and issues we've had, it's still amazing being out here. And I think I mean this is one of the safest places in the world right now, and I'm very appreciative of that. Fact. <laughs> um, I am very glad of how, like, glad that the school has been so efficient with treating the virus. It's been very nice to see as a student, as an international student. Um, I don't think, as you said, only three Asian exchange students left after the semester, after the, the, the virus started. I think all of us feel very safe here, and I think we're all very glad that we didn't go home because it's a very safe environment right now. Yeah. Was people like universities or parents, were they asking you to return? Um, yes. For the well, I'm a full-time student, so I didn't have a university to ask me to go home. But um, <laughs> my parents definitely at first were like, are you sure you don't want to come home? Are you sure? Are you sure? And then uh, as soon as they started seeing how well Korea was handling it, how well the school was, um, I think they were just like, stay, yeah, stay there, <laughs> please. And I think that was a good decision, especially as an American. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Good to hear and I'm happy to, happy to have you there in Seoul. Okay, uh, what about, let's say, Michael, uh, how is it there at your university now during this current semester that uh, did your students return who were studying abroad, have they returned back home mainly or still are they studying in another country? Well, we've had different situations. Most of the students uh, stayed on campus, um, even on lockdown, and, and they just um, they, they worked from home because all of the classes were provided online. But um, and now they're slowly going back to their countries when it's possible, because the, the current situation is still the fact that most of the, the, the flights are not available. And uh, there's still this question of, of border control, mostly. But 
despite that we've not had many too many too many problems in the in the last two months and now we are very much wondering about september of course um because uh, we have a lot of uh, students expecting some answers about whether they'll be able to go or not and this is what we're working on basically um for, for most of our students um Right. What is and it? That, what is it in uh, like reality, in concrete? Like what kind of actions you are when you say that you are working on this? That well, the, the 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 first question is uh, things that we cannot decide for, um, and we can we cannot do much about. Like uh, the, this question of uh, flights and border control is probably the most significant issue. I, I I saw the poll like a minute ago about the worries that the student have about next um, the next semester and uh, well let me take that back so the the some of the questions apparently that is the most worrying the students is whether the the student mobilities will be allowed in our case we 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 will allow all students to go if they if they can uh, find the flight and get the visa and if the the, the borders are open in a in september but this is something something we still don't know about uh, so we are waiting for the the government to decide whether uh, that will become possible but it's uh, and and most of the questions are related to this i mean the like the visas for the french students uh, going abroad will be will be available um uh I suppose pretty soon, but it's if if they can't find the flight to go abroad, then that that would be a little, uh, fairly limiting for, for these students. Yeah, that's uh, that's most of the worries we have right now. Yeah, that's that's. I, I guess that most of our sharing the same like situation and same worries. I think it all depends if the borders are open. If they will be, then there will be flights available as well. And uh, also visas will be issued. So it's kind of a snowball effect there. So at this moment, I think it's we are very much dependent on the government's decisions yes. and how, how autonomous decisions the universities can make after that. Okay, uh, what about Akos? Would you like to comment how you see this situation in Germany, which is a very big, of course, uh, like a sending market and but also incoming students to study there well it's an interesting situation because the perception is at least internationally that uh, germany uh, has been dealing quite well with the covid 19 outbreak of course we also have regional differences here in the country but i think the most important thing was that um, we reacted quite at an early stage of the outbreak so we won time uh, which is very valuable for, for us. Um, in terms of the incoming students, of course, the biggest deal at the moment is that we have a travel ban uh, coming into the, uh, the EU, but also that most of the German embassies has, uh, has been closed um, for a while now. So even if someone got admission to a German university, um, um, it is quite difficult to deal with the visa. Um, so um, I think most of the German universities, uh, both for incoming and outgoing students, um, um, are uh, uh, quite uh, nervous because we don't know how the September intake will look like in terms of the international student numbers. Um, because A, the, the visa situation is a challenge and B, we, we are not sure how the restrictions might uh, be reintroduced if it's necessary. At the moment, um, the country is, um, um, opening up again um, in the last days we just got announced that uh, um, most of the shops will be reopening uh, the schools uh, uh, are reopening so we are going back to this so called new normal um, but of course if the situation is changing and if the number of cases are increasing in the future restrictions will be needed to reintroduce so I think um, for the entire industry this, this uncertain time uh, is like a poison and we need to be very cautious in how we are dealing with the situation. Okay, thank you, Akos. And uh, how do you see, I, I know that you are working a lot with uh, student recruitment and marketing, so this is of course affecting, uh, we are not able to go to the study fairs, and, uh, and especially if we are talking about like, decreasing students. And, mm -hmm. and how, how do you see, what kind of new actions you have needed to introduce now as a university? 
Well, basically, um, all the face-to-face -face activities, all the travels, all the fairs are suspended, um, which is a huge challenge for every university, uh, of course, and every marketer. Um, we completely um, run our um, recruitment activities now online, which, of course, limits um, most of our uh, activities. Uh, we are running a lot of webinars, um, but those are more as uh, a conversion activity. Um, so at the moment, um, uh, of course, our hands are very tight, to be honest. What we anticipate is, to be honest, that generally speaking, the interest in studying in Germany will be growing uh, within the next couple of months, especially from the European countries, since, you know, the UK has a large market share in, in Europe. Um, but depending on, on how this country is dealing with COVID-19, we anticipate that many of the European students will be reconsidering whether they should go to the UK for, for a bachelor's or master's degree, and they will look for other English taught programs within Europe. And I think that Germany will uh, benefit from this development as the country offers um, a wide range of English taught bachelor's and master's degrees. Okay, thank you. That was very comprehensive, like a uh, image that what is the situation now in Germany. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Janne, can we now maybe hear you? Okay, let's try. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. How is life in the greenest campus in the world? Well, it's beautiful as always. Uh, and and Harry, thank you very much for your LUG introduction. It was done very well. Uh, yeah, uh, tiny, tiny technical issues, but now back, back on business. Uh, well, okay. would you like to how, how do you see yeah, the situation there in Eastern Finland or Finland generally? Uh, what kind of actions uh, your university is taking for concerning student mobility? How do you see the upcoming autumn semester? Well, we have been running uh, all the classes online since mid mid march so so the, so the this semester is kind of done in 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 online mode uh, but starting from june 1st we are able to have a, a a people maximum 50 to covering covering together so so it it helps a little bit and and, and what we are planning for fall semester we are planning to run the fall semester business as usual. Of course, we have no idea will there be some setbacks on 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 COVID nineteen issue uh, in in Finland. But now it seems to be that things are going quite well, and and and, and the the virus is very much under under control. And especially in in our our region, we haven't had like uh, one infection in last two weeks so 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 basically not existing anymore in 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 our region but in Helsinki region there are still some infections per day but but not very serious situations so, so we are very kind of we are hoping very much that we are able to start the semester business as, as usual, as I mentioned, but of course we are making some uh, preparation for, for, for if we need to go online, uh, building our orientation fully digitalized and, 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 and also starting the semester online for, for the reason that, that even the uh, COVID-19 is, 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 might be gone, but, but, but still there might be very difficult to get a resident permit on, on time uh, when the semester starts. So, so we need to be ready for, for uh, providing, providing education also online for those who are going to miss the start of the semester. So, so yeah, basically that's the situation in in Finland and in in La Peranta at this point. All right, thank you, Jana, for sharing. I feel that in Finland generally, uh, all the universities, all the thirty-five or so, what we have 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 had this similar kind of approach that if borders are open, if it's possible to travel, then uh, it is okay. And uh, mainly also, 
in Germany, I have had few calls with multiple universities, and it seems that this is kind of the uh, situation at the moment how they are seeing it as well. But yes, very difficult to predict, and who knows when there's a new wave coming and how it will affect. But uh, I guess we need to kind of work on the best possible information that we have, and I think this session is one part of that. Also, what has been the, one of the silver linings is here the kind of the fast reaction and flexibility from multiple universities now. I can tell that our partners in Asia have uh, very rapidly agreed that, okay, let's continue with extended application deadlines. And some destinations are even allowing their the international students to travel to the country as a tourist. And then within the first one or two weeks, they can go to a neighboring country in Singapore, in Kuala Lumpur, and pick up their student visas if there's uh, like residence permit issues in Europe. So uh, people have been becoming more creative, I would say. Okay, uh, my next question would be going for uh, uh, Tuomas there in Hong Kong. You have been uh, monitoring the situation, and I know that you were a couple of weeks ago still traveling in many of these destinations that we have. How do you see Asia now generally? And uh, can you give some report from your point of view? How is the life there? How in Hong Kong in general in Asia? Yeah, of course. I mean, like uh, Hong Kong has been one of the success stories similarly than Korea, of course. And we have only like a bit more uh, thousand cases, I think 1043 or something today. And it's been like the more than the past uh, 14, 15 days now, no new domestic infections anymore. And every single uh, person who is arriving to Hong Kong is tested also at the airport at the moment that the results are given in 12 hours. So it's extremely efficient process that we have here in place. But uh, I think it's not only uh, Korea or Hong Kong that are the success stories here in Asia. Also, Taipei has, uh, Taiwan has been extremely uh, successful, and, and and also like Macau, of course, and and even China. In if if you are comparing China to many other countries at the moment, and then Thailand, and I, I see like um, lots of you know. Uh, uh, good things happening here in Asia at the moment and, and life is pretty normal here in Hong Kong like all the restaurants everything has been actually uh, open all the time just some main, minor restrictions like perhaps the cinemas or something have been closed but uh, but I think uh, uh, it looks actually pretty good here at the moment and, and I hope that also like uh, the other countries will be you know experiencing similar situation very soon in not only in Asia but also in Europe and, and, and North America and everywhere. Mm. Okay, then I have a question that anybody can comment. Of course, all these uh, other questions you, everybody can comment, but I hope I can get lots of opinions from the panelists. So what are the things that you would like that would remain after this pandemic? That What things you have now introduced or faced in your daily work that you hope that will remain still in 2021 and after the crisis? Anybody can speak out. If nobody is answering, then I'll, I'll try to try to comment on this. Um, for me, it was fascinating to see how many universities were able to switch to online teaching really within a couple of days and this technical innovation was really good for the industry so I hope that we will keep this online part not you know, not instead of the face-to-face -face teaching but as an addition um, because I think the modern world um, benefits from from this technical revolution what has happened within our industry what about Dr. Ree would you have a comment on this question as well. Uh, sure. Uh, this is Yuna. Well, um, I'm also a professor as well, so I really had to quickly adapt to online teaching, which I've never actually been doing. Um, and I agree that the online teaching uh, technology will continue um, its course, um, but 
there also is a downside uh, to this um, setting where a university like ours, uh, in which we need close face-to-face -face interactions, um, we still kind of feel it's not really a full technology that can deliver what we need to deliver for our students in our um, specialized uh, education in uh, specific languages and whatnot. But it's, it's going to change the scenes because our students are requesting that we have more online classes, even for uh, the specialized uh, language parts as well. So it remains to be seen whether a university like ours uh, will also uh, step into the bandwagon of online education overall. And to be frank with you, as a, a part of a uh, university administrator as well, um, there's clearly is a threat to uh, the online um, class uh, provision where uh, traditional universities are not allowed to do cyber university offer uh, cyber university classes um, in Korea um, uh, legally. So it's it, in Korea. It's it's going to take some time to actually uh, incorporate the online learning system to the private universities like ours. And also, this is not your question, um, Harry, but um, I would like to point out uh, to the fact where um, with this pandemic um, crisis management, I uh, really desperately felt that we need more systemized um, management of student information uh, for international student mobility. And it seems as though it's quite quite um, out of date in, in a sense, because I realized that we can't really um, kind of pinpoint the data points that we wanted or we needed um, to actually deal with the uh, pandemic issues here as a manager of international students. So I think aside from the online teachings, I think we need a integrated um, total data management kind of system um, for uh, administrators like us, I think. So I think that's my two cents. All right, thank you very much for sharing. I, th I thought that I actually would have liked to ask the same also with from Peter. Are you Peter still there? Can Peter Westerbakka hear us? He's not like an actual panelist, but if he would be still there, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So my question that uh, was that uh, what would you like to retain after this crisis in life? generally and uh, because you have been working with mobile games and uh, startups and whatnot so how what would you think that this is what is the good thing in this crisis yeah but i, I think that uh, uh, what has been very good is is actually to see uh, what is possible uh, so I, I think that uh, i mean if you look at uh, all of education and uh, you know the fact that uh, we moved everybody, uh, you know, more than a uh, billion students to remote learning in, in a matter of days. And I, if I look at like here in Finland, we got, uh, you know, all the schools, all the teachers, all the kids online, like in two days. And if uh, if I would have uh, told people, uh, you know, last year before the crisis that, uh, of course, we can do this and we can have, you know, like uh, people uh, participating online and uh, we will have the whole country, uh, you know, uh, sorted in two days. Uh, nobody would have believed me and I would have been told that, okay, it's impossible and, you know, there are all these reasons why not. And of course, then when we had to do that, uh, you know, of course, it wasn't perfect or, or anything like that. And there are lots of challenges with this, but it's a great example of the fact that uh, it is possible. It wasn't impossible. So uh, I think that uh, that is kind of like a very good lesson uh, always that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we just have to do things and they are not like perfect. And I think that this is very Kind of like normal in the startup world that uh, you know you you do things you learn and you do things better and I think that that is a very positive outcome of this crisis that now we see that we can do a lot of things we can do a lot of things at scale and of course uh, it's not always uh, perfect but uh, it's it's kind of like better than nothing and I think that we will see a lot of uh, innovation coming out of this and we can do more 
of these like blended uh, hybrid models, uh, you know, crisis or not. So, so I think that uh, we should capture these kind of, uh, let's say, learnings and, and these kind of opportunities in the crisis. So it's it's kind of like not all bad. So it, it's it's again uh, uh, very important that we we look always look at the bright side and and then kind of like we move on and uh, kind of like no crisis lasts forever. So so I think that it's uh, it's important to kind of like uh, look at uh, the situation that we have like uh, uh, kind of like post crisis as well and, and there are definitely opportunities to do things uh, yeah. if we can do things better. Exactly. Yes, well, yeah, so clearly. Uh, uh, yeah, please yeah. go ahead, professor. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So maybe I can just try to comment here. So uh, I also see like uh, I, I'm, I'm talking a lot with our ASAM partner universities being based in Hong Kong and I was traveling uh, to multiple countries until mid-March and then eventually I needed to come back here. But uh, but I see like, uh, you know, all the hard work that uh, the universities that we are representing here in ASA are doing and, and, and they are really like uh, thinking that uh, that even even though there's a crisis, uh, they want to increase the student mobility. And it's just like Peter said earlier today, it's, it's just so important and essential for us that uh, to keep the, you know, the students moving and I increase the student mobility and, 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 and the partner universities that we are representing in ASA have been extremely flexible in many ways. It's not only about, you know, online studies, but also like uh, by extending the deadlines or or, or, or arriving late or being flexible on timing the uh, semester beginning or, or something like that. So, so all, all the universities are still kind of like uh, very interested in, in increasing the student mobility, even in 2020 here in Asia, as much as it is possible. Okay, thanks Thomas for the insight. There's a good question in the question and answers that about the online studies. So question for the panelists uh, uh, from the university is that uh, is there anyone who is not planning to introduce online studies if there's not possibility to travel to your country? I guess the silence means that everybody is planning to inter introduce those uh, online classes. Okay, I sorry, my, my mic was off. Uh, yeah. I can say something about that. Sure. Um, right, we've had we've had a lot of questions either from uh, both from the French government and from the European Commission as well to implement uh, online courses uh, September. But first of all, it, it's very different from what we were able to do. Uh, in between March and May, uh, providing the courses that we were supposed to to give in, in class at the university online and giving a full semester online in the next semester. For us, um, that's what I, kind of what I wrote, but for us, uh, the study abroad experience is much more than uh, an online delivery of courses. So we've chosen to limit the number of classes that we'll provide. And in most cases, we'll deliver some, some courses online to the students who will still be able to come in the second semester. But we don't want to replace um, most of the programs that we were supposed to receive and to send um, uh, in, in physical experiences towards uh, online experiences. First of all, because for some reasons we have um, we still have some students who will be able to come and will deliver the the class the courses at the university and that would imply giving them at the same time online and uh, in class so that's something which is very difficult for the for the teachers uh, for the for the professors and this is not really what we want to implement um, but yeah. that's that's not our objective that's really not what we're looking for we expecting uh, as much as possible that we'll have some uh, as what i wrote the the travel bans will be lifted and and the visas will be delivered so that we could send the students abroad i think we can trust in, in most universities to implement everything to ensure the safety of the students sure yeah safety first definitely and i think it's it's like the backup plan i believe for for most universities this online and i guess it's a little bit different or quite much different than uh, if you are considering doing the whole degree then it 
it's kind of a okay, understandable if you are making the first semester, for example, online uh, because there's no other option and uh, other countries are facing the same restrictions. But if we are talking about student mobility, for many students that might be even the most meaningful semester of their whole studies, like uh, I can tell only on my behalf that when I went to China, that's that's when we came up of the idea of establishing the company. And because of my work traveling, I met my lovely Finnish wife in Thailand. So the whole life is kind of around this exchange experience. So it really can be a life changing for everybody or anybody who is going abroad. And if you are just doing that online, of course, you are missing like. 90% of that, I, that's like a, my opinion. But uh, very good insights. Um, Maddie, you're still there. I would like to ask you that, um, is there something in your mind that you hope that would have been done differently from the university or from the country uh, at this moment? Or how satisfied you are with everything? Um. So overall, I am pretty satisfied. Um, more, the most trouble I think a lot of us international students had um, during this crisis when we were in Korea is a lot of the communication was in Korean. So we struggled a lot with um, trying to translate everything. And um, a big issue that uh, international students had when we were out here is um, getting masks. We really, really, for the first like month, we could not get a hold of masks at all. We're having to like buy them for inflated prices off of like sellers on the streets and stuff. And thankfully, like they've got those issues under control. But um, com compared to what the like the government did, I think um, the school did a little bit better than um, Korea in general because they they're used to the international population and they communicated to us as much as possible a lot of it was still in korean and i it, i understand how difficult it was to try to communicate to 3,000 international students um exactly what is happening and i think there was a lot of confusion at first but eventually um through both the school communicating with us and then students communicating with each other like we have this massive whatsapp group which is hundreds of students who and we're constantly asking to questions and we have cacao groups that are constantly asking questions communicating with other people and um it's it was hard at first definitely especially being in another country that you don't speak the language of but um I think the school and the students really got a hang of everything and it's definitely gotten a lot better as time has gone and people feel a lot more confident in the situation. I didn't hear that. So I think it's uh, time for my last question before we will uh, wrap up. Uh, I would like each of the panelists name one thing like around increase collaboration, an example of this, or new innovations, what has happened during the past month because of this crisis. I'll start from Thomas. Well, uh, yeah, well, uh, I think um, one thing is, of course, that uh, at least here, I would say, in Asia, it's been becoming also more safe in, in many ways, not only, you know, the COVID-19 wise, but uh, I think uh, many of the universities and, 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 and the societies here are thinking more about the safety aspects. And and that's, of course, like a really, really good thing. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, in that sense, things are also improving fast here in this part of the world. Okay, Thomas, uh, your opinion about the mask thing, which is a big debate, for example, here in Finland. How does it look for you there in, in Asia to hear this debate about should we or should we not wear masks? <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, everyone wears a mask here in Hong Kong, although it was kind of like illegal at the time when the crisis started because we had uh, one other, another crisis, the social unrest that started last June, last year or so. So I think, uh, uh, well, yes, at least it seems to be working pretty well. And I mean, uh, I wear it every single day. I go somewhere and, and, and still, even though we haven't had any infections for a very long time already, but uh, I think uh, it somehow works, and uh, at least I don't feel that uh, it's that much like anything that I, 
I'm losing about if if I bear it. So <laughs> so I guess it's a it's a good thing and it works. Okay, thanks, Janne. Some innovation or collaboration increasing because of this. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, there are a few few points. First of all, uh, our cooperation on the national level between the universities has kind of take a, a huge step forward. Uh, usually, we used to say that it takes like a million years to 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 be able to agree between the universities certain things. Now, in the past few months, we have been able to kind of solve several issues together. So, so it, it has change a, a kind of uh, way of working between the universities in Finland and also with our international partners we have been discussing well there has been a lot of discussing about the virtual mobility for a long time but but no kind of real action has been taken on but but now it seems to be that that combination of 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 of, of kind of on-site mobility or real mobility and, and virtual mobility there might be very interesting uh, uh, starts startups from from that and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward what what we what we will come up with 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 that and and, and, and I think that's kind of uh, we take kind of fast start for, for that thing because all the universities now need to do something on online and most studies online and we realize that yes we can do that and and and, and it definitely boost boost uh, virtual mobility especially if these pandemics will be a new normal in a in a, in a world that, that this pandemic take place each and every three or four years we have to find a, a, a new ways to do do things but but even without the new pandemics uh, uh, probably the virtual mobility will increase heavily after after the crisis yes thank you Jan. Uh, michael what about there in france and at your university what good things this is bringing up <laughs> I think it's it's bringing uh, well it's it's bringing uh, lots of hope for the future. First of all, um, I I wanted to stress one of the points that was raised by uh, Madi about the the communication among people. Um, at the same time, we had a lot of uh, ongoing communication between the, the different students and different communities, but uh, it was also difficult to to keep everyone updated with the the situation at the different levels the, the national level the local level so that's that's one of the challenges that we'll have to to handle for the future to make sure that everyone is is well aware of, about how the situation is going but there's a there's for us a, a, and we want to keep a lot of hope for the for the situ for, for the whole situation because it I, I really appreciated what was said by Peter at the beginning of the keynote speech which is from every crisis, there are new opportunities that can be drawn, and for us, it seems like very possible that that there are a lot of the opportunities that will be brought uh, to um, student exchanges, mobilities, and and all of the things that we do on a regular basis. Also, what I what I trust, and I, that's something I told you the other day, Harry, is the fact that when you have a, a network and and a and some a group of people looking like Asia Exchange, um, checking on on the situation of all the students, checking on the situations in the various universities in the various countries. That's very uh, securing for the for the students who want to to travel abroad, and that's uh, something I, I really I I really appreciate when I send uh, my students abroad because it's as as was mentioned already. We all send a lot of students abroad, and we need to have um, confidence in in all of the partners and networks within which we send these students abroad. So that's that's something that um, Asia Exchange is able to provide, and that's very reassuring for everyone, from the students to the parents, and also from the the staff and and the universities who send these students uh, all around the world. Thank you, Michael, for those kind words, and very, very happy to 
help together your students and uh, maybe Yuna, you are interested to hear that the two first students from Michael's University are actually to Korea. And <laughs> so they are planning to come next semester and 2021 spring. I just checked the records. So uh, what about Akos, you? Uh, and before I let Akos to continue, I need to apologize. We are having a, a technical issue that we are seeing only one person uh, Lady with the blue blue uh, jacket there might be that we have two Michaels as a co-hosts and the other Michael is uh, not the one that was just speaking. <laughs> but if the other Michael, <laughs> sort of called Michael, can uh, maybe I don't know mute or try to hide the window, then uh, might be that we are not we might be seeing the other panelists there. But. Uh, Main thing that you are hearing your voice. So, Akos, uh, what kind of new things there is because of this? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that, um, I mean, it, it hasn't happened yet, but I think it will happen that in terms of student recruitment, uh, most of the countries, markets, and universities will uh, stronger di di diversify the, the source uh, countries and the source markets. Typically, English-speaking universities are relying heavily on China and India as a source market. I think in the future, um, also led by the crisis, um, many of the institutions will even stronger try to diversify their uh, student population and rely also on uh, tier two and tier three markets um, for not to be that dependent on one single um, single source market like China. I, I hope it's going to happen. I think it's not there yet, but um, the crisis will uh, capitalize and catalyze this. Yes, very good. And then uh, last but not least, Yuna, I think you already brought up very good innovations, but what would be like the one that you would like to still mention? Can we still hear Yuna? Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Briefly, okay, the sorry, my mic is on. Okay, well, um, thank you for having uh, us all together here, Harry, first of all. Um, I think it was very informative and very insightful. Um, but what I would like to add as my final comment is this, actually. You may call me really old-fashioned, but I realized that face-to-face -face interaction among people and um, among international students and faculty members, it's so precious. Um, I really would like to see more of the face-to-face -face interaction um, flourish after this pandemic. We'll be better um, in terms of dealing with this type of of, um, pandemic and we'll be better in dealing with crisis management and we'll have better um, relationship building um, as a result of this experience that we all together had as the world. Um, so I hope that uh, we will uh, be provided with more interaction opportunities uh, with the help of a firm like Asia Exchange and Huffs is ready for business so you might want to look into us uh, further. Um, and I think that's the last words that I would like to live with. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Yuna. And I promise this is a great idea from you. Uh, let's have a get together physically after EAIE in Barcelona in uh, next October. So everybody here is invited, definitely. All right, uh, my final slides, the final wrap up. We are four minutes over time. Uh, my colleague can kindly fix it. So, when I was calling universities and mentioning about this Thursday's event, everybody was asking that, hey, are you also planning to have a similar kind of thing for students? Because many students, many parents are now like worried is it possible to go? Should they go? Is it safe? And so on. And for that reason, we are now also having a similar kind of session but for students and their parents. It's taking place on May 26th, and uh, we are inviting also students who are, who are at the moment at the destinations who are sharing 
unbiased information how to they feel better. So we will send you this link to that webinar, and uh, hopefully if you are willing, you can deliver it to the students who might be interested in it. And then for you, uh, we are, our friend in uh, Malaysia actually have just opened up this EduCafe online. So it's not the same than face-to-face, -face, but it's better than nothing. And uh, we can send you the link. It's, like it's open every Monday, so you just go there, have a cup of virtual coffee and talk with the people about educational matters. So hopefully that can bring us closer to each other, even though physically we are far away. I want to thank you everybody for coming to this session. It really warms my heart and uh, I hope we can continue collaborating together and let's hope that this will not be uh, like too long stop for international student mobility. That is the most precious thing we can have. That is solving so many crises and issues in the world when we are seeing other people, other cult cultures and other, other countries. We will share you this uh, video of this and also uh, the presentations and we will send you also the link for the student, student uh, webinar very soon. Thank you so much. Be positive. Remember to stay negative. Stay safe. See you again. Bye. Bye-bye.